Welcome to today's webinar presentation. Today's topic is going to be, is the resume authentic candidate assessment in the modern world? Uh, my name is David Graves of Group One Background Screening. Currently, I'm the sales representative and your HR consultant for all things background screening. I'm here today with Danny Davila, Group One's Director of FCRA Regulatory Risk and Consumer Compliance Advisor. It's an honor to have you here today, Danny, with us, and uh, he's our resident expert, and we do appreciate you taking the time today out of your busy schedule to join us. Thank you, David. I appreciate being here, and uh, let's hope we can all gain some information from this presentation today. Just a little bit of uh, bio about Danny. Danny's worked at uh, worked in the background screening and talent acquisition field for about 30 years or more. He served as an employment manager and the director of workforce recruitment at Parkland Health and Hospital System for over a decade. Uh, later, he served as the division recruitment manager at HCA North Texas. He has been with Group One now seven years, right, Danny? That's correct, Dave. Providing his experience and expertise involving decisions related to FCRA regulatory risk and compliance. And Danny, what a thrill it is to have you here today. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it, David. And uh, just to remind all of our uh, participants, first of all, thanks for being on the on the actual call and in you know seeing us. Um, if you're a client of Group One, we really appreciate it and. And I don't want to, any of you to um, to take this in a, in a negative way, but um, a lot of your candidates have been through this. So if you hear any situations that you think sound like yours, uh, I'm not using any names or any people for real. Okay, <laughs> so let's let's just get that out in the open. Um, the other thing is David has a disclaimer to give. I do. I'll and, share that uh, in just a moment. And, he, and we want you to be sure that you you understand this disclaimer before we go forward. Yeah, and uh, part of that disclaimer, you kind of moved me forward here just a little bit uh, before some other things I was going to talk about, but he's referring to our legal disclaimer, just basically reminding everybody that he and I, neither one of us are attorneys or legal professionals. Uh, all the information that we're going to present today, it's not to be considered as legal advice. You should always, always, always consult your legal counsel when it comes to background screening and compliance issues. However, like Danny said, we we do uh, hope that the information that we provide with to you today will be helpful in your selection process and give you better insight into what it takes uh, to hire authentic people for your organization. Um, I'm just excited about today's topic uh, because I really believe it's going to be highly educational and informative uh, for everyone that's listening. Uh, just a little bit of background about myself is I've been an HR generalist for over 20 years before coming to Group One, uh, and I can remember lots of interviews and countless uh, resumes that I reviewed in my career, like many of you, and I know you have too, Danny, as well. And probably just like you, we always assume, especially probably early in our HR career or recruiting career, we probably assumed that everything that was written on our resume uh, was all factual. Uh, but according to some of the data that we're going to look at today and the things that you're going to talk about today, that really isn't uh, the case, that not everybody's always truthful on their resumes. Uh, today, with the advances in technology, virtual job searches, fraudulent resumes and job profiles have increased. And Danny, I know you're going to talk about uh, some of these elements. And so without further ado, why don't you go ahead and uh, start uh, telling us a little bit more about fraudulent resumes and things we need to be aware about as HR practitioners. Well, thank you, David. Uh, let's start off with a couple of, of, of pieces before we get to the six elements that will help us get to understand how we arrived here. Uh, I was sharing with our team right before the presentation that uh, I, I'm going to age myself for those of you in the audience. So if some mm. of you are nodding your heads, then you're right there with me. But um, if you remember that we used to actually use paper applications at one time. That's right. People used to those. use a pen and they used to write their stuff down on a paper and they'd get the resume out and they sometimes even got a phone book. The phone book was in the lobby. And for those of you who are 
knowledgeable. Phone book is a big book with names and numbers in there. <laughs> <laughs> so what 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 I remember is seeing all those actual um, applications was a couple of things. It was harder to lie when you had to fill that stuff into a form, right? Because when you had to fill that into a form, you actually had to get the information from somewhere. Well, then we had technology advance, right? And what happens with technology? Well, it, it sort of it makes it a little bit more different, right? Because what technology did is it advanced the process for how people uh, could submit their information. So all of a sudden, you had applicant tracking systems that accepted resumes. And, uh, and, and so all of a sudden, you had resumes starting to take place of an application. Now, one thing that we all know, those of you who are out there, especially if you're experienced recruiters or talent acquisition uh, personnel, you understand the resume itself does not constitute the application. Remember, for your application for employment, you need to have an attestation to confirm that the information is true and accurate. But guess what the, the resume does? And, and David and I talked a little bit right before the meeting. What, what happened is you created these parser uh, engines, or what I like to call robots, inside the system. Artificial intelligence started in, infiltrating what we do. So it copied the keywords from a resume into an application. Well, guess what? What you weren't suspecting these keywords to do is also falsify the candidate's qualifications because the keywords weren't always something essential to what this person's qualifications were. So we started seeing the advent of this, uh, what I call exaggeration of a person's qualification. So when we start looking at resumes, we want to look at basically what are the things that we're looking at. And I arrived at six, co six components of the resume that I think are going to be important for us to consider. Okay, Chris? And, and those of you who don't know, and, and I want to take this short opportunity to, to acknowledge that we have an outstanding director of corporate communications here. Chris Wilson's been with us, and I've worked with a lot of people in communication, folks, and, and rarely have I seen a guy as reliable as Chris is. So if you hear me say the word Chris anytime, it's I want him to move the slide along, but he's also <laughs> holding my hands that I don't fall out of my chair. Okay. <laughs> So Thank you. that's Chris. <laughs> um, six components of the resume that are important to, to remember. Identity. We're going to get into identity in a while. You're going to say, what do you mean? Well, just remember this. You know, those of you involved in social media now, when you go on to a profile on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram, how many of you really believe that the person on the other side really looks and sees and walks and talks the way that they look? I hope a lot of you are, are skeptical as I am and say maybe not even half. Uh, because be, believe me, nobody looks and it looks that good, you know. <laughs> They're exaggerating their images completely. Well, resumes are no different, right? Um, sometimes the people that are sending information over are too good to be true. And I think that's the one thing when we look at identity. Is is the person uh, authentic? Are they real? Or is this another bot? Or is this a person who created a really, really outlandish image of themselves? And that happens. Uh, we have to be aware of this. Uh, it's not unusual. And nowadays, unlike, again, uh, dating myself when I got into this business, you could always put a face to a person or you could always see a person come into the office to complete this information. Nowadays, people complete it in uh, maybe in another country or miles from where your offices are or not even near your systems. So therefore, how do you know that the resume or the application you receive is actually from that individual? Second thing we're going to talk about is employment. How do we start distinguishing the employment, you know, history of someone? And we're going to get into the variables that basically impact employment. And, and, and that's important for you because if you're assessing qualifications, the one thing you need to do as a talent acquisition professional is confirm, can this person actually perform this task that we need? Or are they also embellishing this? Um, and believe me, people are good at embellishing their capabilities. 
It happens all the time. It's happened at government levels. It's happened in entertainment. It's happened in, in news. It happens in every profession. So we're not limited in healthcare. Now, education is the one concern that I don't think we all have a clean answer to, and we're going to get to that. But both education at all levels, uh, high school education is becoming harder to validate. College education now has become very splintered. And then, of course, you have, you know, this growing sense of homeschool and charter schools. And, and my question to them is, who, well, who keeps your records? And, and unfortunately, my responses are, well, what records? And, and that's the kind of condition that we're in. Now, we'll talk about credentials, and credentials are important to all of us. If you're on the other side right now, and thank you for, again, joining this uh, webinar, because we really appreciate your participation. Um, the one thing you always ask us is, is, you know, we need to validate this person's credentials, because in healthcare, guess what? You don't validate a credential, they can't see a patient, and you can't bill CMS. And if you can't bill CMS, you don't get income, right? So I think from our standpoint, how do we credit, we validate credentials? Well, we don't validate a credential just because the client says, I have a nursing license. We have to check with the boards, and we have to do that work. I'm going to show you how some of these falsified credentials come across. And then in social media, Again, uh, the one, uh, if you want to say in the last 10 years what has changed about your market in terms of talent acquisition is, again, the increased pressure on people coming into the workforce to create this, what I consider to be a, an image, an image that's not always uh, alike with the persona of, of what's on social media. Uh, how many of us really believe that people that are on social media are telling the truth? Nobody ever wants to reflect some of their challenges or some of their failures. Uh, I read a quote the other day from, from uh, unlikely a source, Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan, although he won six or seven world titles with the NBA Chicago Bulls. Six. Six. Thank you, Chris. The one thing he said was, there's no way you get to there without failure. And that's the one thing people don't want to admit, that they failed at something. So what does resumes and social media do? They force people to tell them all about the successes. You never, anybody, it never says, well, this is what I failed at. And this is what didn't work, right? <laughs> Here's <laughs> and, all my mistakes. Yeah, here are all <laughs> my, yeah, because guess what? How else would you have learned without those failures? So, so social media has created this, again, what I can see a fantasy image of, all of us are so great and we all walk on water, yet you come into the job and three days later you're wondering, where did we get this candidate from? And how? And then all of a sudden you're bashing your heads in over there, friends, because you have 26% turnover after you just hired people. And there's even services that you can pay to take your resume and even fluff yeah. it up even yeah. more. and. Uh, try to make it look even all the more impressive. Well, David, David's right on point. Is is look at how many emails you may be getting, or your candidates are getting from bots saying, "Let me do your resume for free, and let me improve your presentation, and how well can your resume get you know matched?" Well, when you have sources like Indeed and uh, all these other resume parsing systems and, and matching systems, you're going to create this competition to get the best keywords out there. And it's not about getting the right accurate representation of your candidacy. It's more about how well can you stand out in social media. Now we're going to talk about references. And again, the, the, the key part about references are this, is first of all, you want to be able to talk to somebody or have us talk to somebody who can validate your work experience. Uh, you also want to be able to make sure that they understand why they're being contacted. One of the things about references are they're important if they can validate that work history, but they're also going to be somewhat, um, if you're trying to get the reference to embellish for you, eventually those lies tend to pile up. And so we want to stay away from that. So before we go any further, David, anything, any thoughts? Yeah, and the interesting thing about uh, references kind of alluding to what you just said is obviously if I'm going to uh, get a reference, I'm going to have make sure that it's a reference that's going to speak very well of me. I'm not going to go find the reference that's going to uh, talk about my mistakes of why maybe I was let go somewhere down the road, right? I'm going to 
probably use the references that are only going to speak well to me. In fact, I'm going to call them ahead of time and make sure uh, that when they get that phone call, to make sure that you really fluff me up well. <laughs> well, and you bring up a good point about that because the one thing about a resume, it does have a lifeline. And, and one thing that if you're assessing resumes, you sort of you may want to find out how recent is this resume? When was it last updated? Because those references tend to lie, you know log out in a sense. Uh, I, uh, this is a this is funny, but it's also true. I still have my letter of reference that I received from the folks at IBM in 1974. It's on a crinkled old piece of paper, and it's written by the three guys, the engineers that were my bosses. Now, why do I keep that? Because of our insecurities, right? Because before social media, we sort of wallowed in self-pity. So we always would read these reference letters for support. Well, guess what? Nowadays, people just go on social media and lie. So th what this reference letter does is sometimes says, yeah, this person's going to say something good about me. Well, some of your candidates want to take it a little bit further, and they want to get somebody who maybe says a lot more for them. So let's be careful of what references we choose. All right, Chris. So one of the things about the identity is this. Unfortunately, we cannot validate identity just with a background report request. We can get a lot of clues and we can get a lot of information to tell you how ah, this person may not be who they're saying they are. And and here are the elements that we're going to review. And and a couple of things. I love that they use this resource from the movie um Super bad. Super bad. Yes. Thank McLovin. you, Chris. I haven't McLovin. Seen it. <laughs> you know, I, I love this. And this is true, truly indicative. And this is your workforce, folks. Uh, <laughs> McLovin does exist. Uh, he was able to get a uh, an identification card indicating that he was 16 years old at the time that he was an adult and he was from Hawaii when in fact he was from California and 16 years old and the fact that he only had one name <laughs> McLovin it wasn't even Mac Lovin uh, <clears throat> so what that says is social security cards identification cards passports all can be fabricated. All of them. Um, when I say IDs can be purchased, and I'm going to tell you the truth, a Social Security card and a driver's license right now can be bought at your local flea market. If you go to the right booth and you talk to the right person and you have a couple hundred dollars, you can buy an item that's going to have a hologram. It's going to have all the authentic information. It'll have your picture on it. And before you know it, you become another person in this. Did you want to provide the address of where they can obtain these? So we're not promoting this at no, all. No, but saying. I can tell you there's one in Grand Prairie. Uh, and the reason why I know this is, in, and I'm going to go into one of my first case histories. So, guys, as you're going along, and this is for my, our team internally. In one of my employers, we had a case where uh, we would perform audits every year of our employment workforce. One of the audits came back with at least 12 people who came back with Social Security cards of people that were deceased. So, again, how can you be deceased and still paying into the Social Security system, right? So, we uh, Social Security did the audit. Then, all of a sudden, I got a list of the people I had to bring in and interview. And sure enough, find out when I interview all 12 of them separately of each other, that each one of them had this falsified Social Security card. So, you're saying, wow. How could that happen? Well, remember, your I-9 eligibility process is a manual process, and you're still checking a physical content card, uh, which is your ID, and then you're checking the Social Security card. You can get a McLovin who could give you a false ID number, a false ID. How would you know the difference, right? It's a physical card. If it looks good, it's got the hologram, it looks, the guy's picture looks authentic. And then you got a false social security number. How would you have known? Because again, you don't have e-verify at the time. So you brought them in and you get them to work and all of a sudden this person, this employee is paying into somebody else's social security bank for those seven or eight years they were working. So 
needless to say, these employees were terminated, they had to go get attorneys, and they had to come back legally into the country to try to get qualified for their job. Now, a couple of things to remember. Now that we have E-Verify, this is a lot more presentable at the onset if you use E-Verify. So my advice to all of you, try to use E-Verify. If you're still using the actual process of manually reviewing these documents, there's, here's a couple of hints. Um, look at that social security number and when we provide you a report, our background report can tell you if that card belongs to somebody who is deceased or alive. And there's a part in the report, and, and David and I can help you with this. If you have emails for us after the event, we can show you on the report where that actual statement is. And there's a, there, it's in a third page of the actual background report that it'll say when the actual Social Security number was issued and whether it's the person's alive or dead. And that'll give you the sense, okay, whew, that's good. The other thing we can do is also validate the identity by noting where did they live and where they were born. So we can check that for you. But just know, just because a person brings in a card and says it belongs to them, doesn't mean that it's them. Identity fraud is, is widespread, and we all know that. But here's some, those are some examples. And, and I love it that they used it in that movie because I think that's the first sense. And again, at that age, what do you have to lose? You know, so, and you, you know, at 18 or 35, people will still try the same thing. But again, this is a good point to go ahead and, and take a pause. Any, any thoughts, David? What do you think? No, I think we're ready to move to the next slide. Okay. Employment. Yes, uh, so I'll leave that slide a sec, Chris, because I do want to address all of you right now out there. How many of you, when you see something that's too good to be true, you're just not sure, you're like, oh, wow, if I open my eyes, am I going to see the real person, or is this too good to be true? And, and the other guy with his covered mouth is saying, I'm not saying anything. And the uh, middle person, of course, she's saying, I'm not hearing anything here. None of us want to accept the truth, folks. We all want our candidates to be shining examples because guess what? Your hiring manager is busting you and telling you, bring somebody to my table today. I need them to start tomorrow. All you can do is get the third or fourth best candidate to drop by your door, and you just want to force them to be qualified. Well, let's just remember this. And I'm going to advise all of you, you are not social workers, you're talent acquisition professionals. You can't help somebody be something that they're not. And that's what we try to do sometimes. We try to create this falsified impression of a candidate, and it just doesn't happen. And here's some ways we can note the differences of employment. All right, Chris? Um, and I do appreciate that Chris didn't put my picture more up there. I appreciate that. And we really have really been putting the crossed eyes and the closed ears. <laughs> so what do you look for in employment? Well, and by the way, before this, this session today, I've been doing a lot of review of, of reports today. And, and I, can t I can tell you these job titles that we hear of and see today, a lot of these, um, I, I don't know if the candidates actually read their own job descriptions anymore. That's one thing that I'm concerned about because when you see these job titles come in from the candidates, rarely do they match with the job titles that are coming back from the employers. So that's the first thing to look at. And most of us want to exaggerate what we do. Uh, I, I have a title right now that if you really looked at it in the ISDN code, it doesn't really exist. I have no idea where it came from. Uh, isn't it elaborate, David? Yeah, it was so long, I almost wanted to put yeah. some abbreviation. Yeah, I, I, I don't even want to put it. I could just put director now. I, it's like, golly. <laughs> so if I put that on a resume, uh, people would say, it doesn't match anything. So sometimes jobs can be exaggerated and not accurately reflect the job itself. Now, the differences in your industries, uh, for example, I use the job title environmental services tech, which is the job title we had at uh, Parkland for people who worked in the uh, janitorial. But again, you can call them janitors, you can call them environmental services techs, you can call them quality service, 
you can call them a lot, but again, just remember those job titles can be different from hospital to hospital, from employer to employer. Same thing goes for the patient care assistants. Uh, we call them PCAs, but they sometimes, some hospitals are called patient care techs. But guess what? In no industry are they called nursing associate, you know, exceptions. Those are the kind of things you want to look at. Um, a couple of years ago, as you all know, we used to have these uh, positions called health unit coordinators, and now they've evolved into medical office assistants and unit techs. Well, again, those job titles, like take a look at them carefully and see what they actually are entailing. Uh, sometimes you have to review the details behind the job titles. And then some job titles purposely are very nebulous, uh, just very nebulous. I'll give you an example. I'm going to say a magic word here that uh, I'm going to have David close his ears because he doesn't like hearing it, but it's called a work number. And the work number issues verification of employment. Well, let me tell you guys what the work number does. They don't include job titles uh, a lot of times, it's, especially if you worked at Walmart and you were like their um, – if you were their 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 warehouse engineer and you worked in the warehouse and you pull stock down and you put it on the forklift and you drove it out, guess what it's going to say? It's going to say associate. It's a very very dull and non-descriptive title. It just says associate. So it gives you no indication of what that person did while they worked at Walmart. So I'll get a question back from the employer saying, well, "What do they do?" They were an associate. So that's why, that's the work number. That's what they report. But can the candidate tell you that they were in procurement and they worked in the warehouse and they got all the warehouse stuff and they put it on a forklift and drove? Yeah, they can tell you that. But unfortunately, it's not in the job title. So that's where it works against the candidate. Sometimes those job titles aren't always accurate. The other thing we want to look at is, is look at the task and are the tasks that they gave you in their application or their resume, are those tasks aligned with some of the tasks that you're looking for? All of you probably have gone through some level of behavior-based interview training. And what is it that you look for is that they have some repeated behavior in the expectation or the competency that you're looking for. So that's what you look for, not for the job title. You don't look for the, uh, the fluff. You want to look at the uh, at the content, and the, uh, the the content that I think is the most exaggerated of any resume, and that's always going to be the tenure, and and tenure is always one reason I think a lot of us forget our, our years. You know, as we get on, we will always imagine our years are longer. We we're a very uh, what is it, masochistic society. We like to think we, we started working with Noah was created and we walked on the ground and we walked the school fifty <laughs> miles, right? No, we didn't. We <laughs> rode the bus. <laughs> and so guess what? Tenure is always outlandish. You know, I worked fifty years. Uh, a common theme that I used to hear at Parkland and in any of you are at Parkland now, thanks for coming on board if you came. Uh, but you may hear this too. It was always somebody who was there when Kennedy was brought into the hospital. Well, really, I don't think anybody's still around for that. But that used to be the actual comment that was given to me all the time. I was here when Kennedy was here. Wow, that's a lot of tenure, you know? Over, that's over 50 years ago. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And if you were 30 years old, yeah, how does the retirement work here? Uh, so, <laughs> So re realistically, look at the tenure carefully. The most fabricated detail on any resume, in my opinion, are the dates worked. And when we get the actual reports back from the employers, they validate that. And we're yeah. not talking about just months. Sometimes we're talking about years. And as a recruiter, I remember often that was the first thing that I would look at or look for on a resume was to see are there any gaps in the employment. But obviously, the thing that you might also want to be looking for is why are there no gaps? Maybe somebody's falsifying just to make sure there aren't any gaps in there to kind of extend it out six months or a year because they were uh, in between jobs in between, but just kind of fluffed it a little bit to make it look smooth. And so sometimes what you don't see there, and that's why it's important to use a background screening company like Group One, because we are going to validate uh, those dates of employment for you. That's a good point, and, and let me elaborate on that, David. I'm glad you brought that up because 
the one thing that I've learned over the last seven years is that in a, a, all of us, if we work in, in a company, we've always started off in one job and moved to another. And we, and your resume will reflect that. I started out as a newspaper writer. I grew into an editor. I became a, a photojournalist. I became this, right? Well, guess what? Unfortunately, nowadays, some of these employment reporting companies don't report all the job titles. They only report the date that they started and then the job title at the end. So you want to stress it. Like, for example, I started off as Parkland as a recruiter. And I was proud of that. You know, it was my really is when I wanted to get out of leadership. Let me just recruit, you know, get in and, and grind it out. And it was my best year of my life because I had no decisions except just try to find people. And the one thing that I liked about that job is I saw literally over 20,000 resumes that year. You know, the one thing that I learned though was that in, in verifying employment here, when I got to group one, when we would go out and find out what jobs did the person report uh, work in, we only got the last job they were in. So right now, the job that I would be reported at an apartment was director of talent acquisition because that was my last job there. It didn't report my re my recruiter job. Okay, so you all see, the other history exactly of jobs at the right. Same so my resume. Job, yeah. So so to my friends out there, that on the resume my recruiter job wouldn't show up, right? And so you say, well, I can't qualify you as a recruiter because it's not on there. And that's right, you know, because it's showing up only director of talent acquisition. So, and we all know that leaders can't do the work. <laughs> 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 so, so from that end, just remember that when you're looking at the resume, some of the validation of the experience is only going to come back with the most recent job held by the person there and not the entire job history. Well, they might include it on their resume, right. their history at Parkland, right. the three or four positions as they work their way up. But as far as what you're saying on the employment background report, um, we may not have that full vision of everything that's on the resume. Right. All right, let's go to the next slides. One of the things that you have now today that maybe wasn't as prevalent before, but you've seen it more is is are going to be what we call contractors or people participating in the gig economy and th this is going to result in more people that are not technically employed by the employers that they're listing these are people that are working under a contract and, and maybe get a 1099 as opposed to a w-2 and if that's the case they need to really clearly identify that when they apply for your position and you may want to ask them, were you an actual employer or were you a contractor? Because that's going to be important. Uh, I've, I've, in, in, in one of my roles, or one of the jobs that I had, we actually sourced for a high-level executive. Found out the last three uh, jobs that this person had, he was not employed directly by that employer. He actually was a contractor. Yet, he held very high-level responsible positions. And so when we had to confirm whether he performed these tasks, we eventually had to talk to different sources to confirm this information. So it doesn't mean that it's not legitimate. It just means you may not find it through traditional sources. So you on your end, you're asking yourself, well, what do I do, Danny? Well, my question to you is make sure that when you conduct your screening interviews or you screen this person's qualifications, find out were they in fact employed by the actual company or were they a contractor. That's all you got to do. And distinguish, and it's going to happen more and more because more people now are willing to just be flexible and have multiple contracts going on at the same time, and and that's going to happen more and more. So, and that's something that that is more prevalent now than it used to be. It used to be we always wanted to be employed and have that name, but nowadays people will have different uh, different assignments at one time. All right, thanks, Chris. Education. Yeah, we're coming up on May, folks. May is in the next month, and guess what happens? You're going to have a lot of these kind of candidates out there, right? On one hand, giving you the uh, yes, thumbs up. On the other hand, blinking their eyes like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> we're not sure if we got our degree or not. <laughs> All right. So, oh, God, this is this is a fun one. I think of any of the items that, that are, are really easy to play with are education. So let me tell you where I came across this. And this happened here at Group One. We had a candidate one year who stated that he had a, a degree 
and uh, from Xavier University. And I said, okay, Xavier's in Louisiana. And I said, okay. Then I found there's an Xavier in Ohio, right? And then there's an Xavier in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I find out that, first of all, he gives us a, a degree and a transcript. So that, that looked official. Look really official, like the like the degrees and transcripts you get at your offices, folks. You know, a lot of the times I hear from you, and really I I do feel for all of you, because you you'll tell me and you show me the degree, you show me the, the the transcript. It looks pretty clean and authentic. Well, guess what? We talk with the college directly because the National Student Clearinghouse, who we use, uh, I call them and they said, well, the school says flat out. And then I said, well, give me the name of the person at the, at the school so I can talk to them. And they said, okay. I said, do you mind if I send you this transcript and this diploma? And this was the official at Xavier University. And the person said, I'll send it to me, Danny, no problem. Send over the actual degree and the transcript. And she pointed out six variables that showed that this was a falsified item. Mm -hmm. Six variables. First of all, it didn't have a seal. It didn't have the correct date stamp on there. The date stamp would have validated the date stamp of when they graduated, the year, the program, and there was a code in there that they embedded to make sure it wasn't falsified. So that code wasn't in there. The other thing was the stock of paper they used was not a, a paper that they would use for a transcript. The transcript itself would be printed on a type of paper that you would use for dollar bills and, and paper currency. So it was very, very unique paper. The other thing was it didn't wasn't initialized by the actual registrar. All the transcripts have to be initialized. So there were six elements we found faulty with this. We came back to the candidate and says, um, you know, respectfully, this cannot be validated. And if you have any questions, feel free to call Xavier University. Here's the transcript coordinator. She'll be more than happy to speak with you. Uh, we disqualified that person pretty quickly. And, and so, again, a lot of that goes on, folks. A lot of that goes on. So a couple of things about colleges and universities. Be wary of their accreditation status. One of the reasons why we're we're sitting here today, besides you know Chris having a really good thought of hey we should do this as a presentation, because again he wants us to get out there and share this with you. And David is always looking for a way to communicate our services to you, our, our folks, and people that you may know. But all of you saw this story that I put out there a couple of weeks ago, and everybody I think all of us in the industry read it, and it was about these colleges in Florida that basically were issuing falsified degrees in the nursing industry. And unfortunately, the millions and millions of dollars spent by candidates for these falsified degrees and then also uh, opportunities to test for their NCLEX. And it's heartbreaking when you hear of it because these folks were taken advantage of. And, and you know, I, I, on the one hand, you feel sorry for them, but on the other hand, you also have to protect your institution, and you have to make sure that you protect them from any bad actors. Well, a lot of colleges and universities can be started start up today without any license, without any kind of validation. Yeah. You know, if, if I had the time and the energy, I could sit down and create my own college and university. But guess what? The Danny Davila University. Yeah, a fraudulent resume. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? There's nobody going to check me. Hey, I don't report to anybody. And that's what these colleges wind up doing. So one of the things is there are several accreditation uh, systems out there. And we normally try to work. That's why we work through the National Student Clearinghouse, because they know which colleges are accredited and which ones are not. Now, we ourselves in Group 1 have a list of accreditation sources that we run these colleges through. If they're not accredited, we'll come back and let you know. And we're proud to say that those colleges that were found guilty in Florida, we had thousands of, of applicants that came through us in the last five years. We didn't approve any of those. We actually send out, did not qualify, did, you know, not validated, not accredited. So accreditation is very, very important. Just because the person has a college degree on their resume doesn't mean that it exactly exists. Remember that. Physical facilities versus online programs. 
Well, we know this happened. The first one was, I believe, University of Phoenix. Remember when University of Phoenix yeah, came out? That. They didn't have a physical campus. It was all online. They had a campus in Arizona. But it is a legitimate organization. They have a degree, and it's accredited. But remember this. They didn't have a physical campus somebody could go to. You could do it online, you know. Well, nowadays, you have a lot more, and you see them. All of you get, And you get candidates from those schools, Western Governors University in Salt Lake City, Utah. I see that all the time. Chamberlain College has various, uh, you know, colleges. Their main campus is in Illinois. And so a lot of these colleges will exist. Just because a college doesn't have a brick and mortar system doesn't mean it's not legitimate. It can be. But again, let it run through a background reporting system, preferably ours, but if not, the other ones that you may use. Get someone to validate it for you. Do not just take it at face value. Here are the ones that I do have a big heartburn over, and that's high schools and college hybrids. Nowadays, you have this middle school college program, and those of you out there, I know you're nodding your heads, right? Those of you at Children's, and those of you at Methodist, and those of you, some of our good partners, the East Texas out there, um, my, friend, my folks at Genesis Prime, I see you on here. You see this. These are people who go to a high school and then go start going the last two years to a college to get credit for college. Well, guess what they'll do on their application? They'll put that they graduated from the college. College says, we have no record of that graduation. We have no record of the right. graduation. We have a, the high school has a record of the graduation. That's who we get the validation from, not the college. The only thing they got from college were the college credits. So remember that. Remind your folks to put down where they graduated from, the high school they graduated from. Also, there's a distinction between going to high school and getting your GED. Folks, if somebody stopped going to high school, let us know because guess what? The high school is going to tell us they did not finish. They didn't finish. It will say N. Mm -hmm. And then guess what? We got to go to the state to find out if they got a GED. Mm -hmm. So just find out up front. Did you get your GED? That that helps everybody with the time because guess what? We can get the GED from the state pretty quickly. Then we have international colleges and universities. Ah, this is fun. And those of you who have gone through this understand the pain that I'm going through. <sighs> <sighs> international colleges and universities have different accreditation programs, folks. And not all of them equal to the same programs here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, well, why does it take maybe a month, a month and a half? Because we got to make sure that the courses they took are the same kind of courses that we would validate here in the United States. So just remember that. You still got to get that validated, okay? All right, Chris. We're looking at the time, and we want to make sure we get to all of these. So... How many people we still got up there? We got a full house. All right, cool. All right, let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. One of the things that we do is we verify all of our degrees through the National Student Clearinghouse. Uh, now, <clears throat> if the clearinghouse cannot find the degree, guess what? That means one or two things. That person lied to you, okay? They, they, they have in, you know, exaggerated their qualifications. More importantly, maybe they didn't pay their final bill. And guess what? A college or university is not required to issue a degree if the person didn't satisfy their financial requirements. So guess what? We're coming up on May next month. A number of your candidates that you're considering for your nursing programs this summer may not have their degrees verified. If they haven't paid their dues, Interesting. if they haven't paid their, their, you know, all their fees and all their information, guess what? They won't have a degree reported. So let's make sure they, they clean that up. But colleges and universities have a real special seal on the transcript. So if you get a transcript, make sure it has that seal. Remember this. Just like with everything else, like with bought resumes and bought work history, you can buy diplomas from a diploma mill. Uh, I can go right now and create a diploma and send it to you. You pay me 50 bucks and you can be a graduate from whatever program you want to be. Unfortunate but true. And I will tell you that all of you in the next week or two will get a couple folks like that. It just happens. 
And you say, how do you know, Danny? Because we, when we go to validate it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> $50. Yeah. Less expensive than my college. Year. Yeah. No, yeah. And then, 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 heavy then yeah. <laughs> and then, and here's a good key. And I was talking to somebody the other day in the industry and they said, you know what a good, good tell is about that? If they can tell you, you get your degree in three days, it means it's false. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all know our degrees took, I don't know, it took me about four years. It took me a little longer. Yeah, than that. it took David about four or five years. You know, yeah. to, you know. So again, nothing happens in three days. So, uh, all right, let's go on. This is what's important about diploma mills. In a lot of cases, there won't be any classroom work. Basically, you answer a questionnaire, you submit it, folk gets a diploma. The other thing is no test to take, and no one is ever turned down. And that's one of the things that people are attracted to. And let me tell you who's attracted to this candidates who dropped out and have not had a chance to go back and get their GED or finish their college. They will turn to this. So does it exist out there? Yes. And will they put it on their resumes? Yes. Hmm. So it's up to you to catch this or try to find the inconsistencies before it gets to us. Because if we, if we catch it, guess what? It's going to come back as did not verify. And again, don't play social work and don't try to advocate for the candidate. It just didn't happen. Okay. <clears throat> the one thing that I do want you to know is that that the no no that's good. The the institution that that issues any of these they have no authority because we've gone back to some of these schools and they'll tell me, oh, I didn't. We don't have any record of this person attending. Somebody mimicked and actually stole their authoritative documentation. Uh, Again, very limited contact details are available for diploma mills. If you try to ever get somebody to validate it, they're not available. So again, easy. Any, and you can go online and find one if you wanted to. You can find a transcript and put your name in there and it'll create a transcript for you. And it's just basically a plug and play. You put your information in and it'll produce your own transcript and it'll say what you wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And then the source material is unprofessional. So again, these diploma mills exist, folks. And you're wondering why am I so skeptical? It's not that, it's I just don't want our patients to get hurt, okay? So the last piece I wanna bring up is gonna be the licensure and the certification and registry. I'm going to go on. On license certification and registry, the one thing that you gotta look for, is you go, uh, in, in our industry, we have to have people have licenses to perform their tasks. So in, in this case, you can go ahead and go on, Chris. In this case, what we need to do is make sure that you're not hiring people with outdated or sanctioned or suspended credentials. The other day, about two weeks ago, I saw a candidate who actually submitted their license, and they were licensed in three states to perform a specific task, where their license in two of the states had received some stipulations, which means that, that they're limited in their scope of what they can do where they try to use the license in the state that they don't have a step. And by that, they would try to circumvent the process. Well, we have an obligation to report that back to the actual requester, the, the candidate employer, and let them know, well, this person has two steps on this. Well, a lot of times the candidates don't want you to report that because that this puts, them, puts them in a very difficult situation. But again, our obligation is to you and you, our clients, our hospitals, our patients to make sure that these candidates credentials are updated and are validated. And that's what we will do, including any provisions that always are on there. Even if those provisions expired, if the credentialing source allows us to, we will post what those provisions were, okay? Social media, we talked a little bit about that. Let's go to the next one. Next slide, David, want to contribute to the LinkedIn Candidate Content Awards and Honors there? Um, as far as what? Well, let's just talk a little bit about social media and LinkedIn. So when you're using LinkedIn nowadays, some people will use a LinkedIn profile to sort of maybe contact a recruiter. And if your your recruiters out there are using LinkedIn to source, a couple things to remember. Remember, LinkedIn, and, and David used this term the other day in our meeting, mm -hmm. it's a marketing tool. Mm -hmm. It's not an application for employment tool, guys. There's no one to validate the information on LinkedIn. No one. That is correct. 
No one can validate the information. I can enter anything I wanted to. Yeah, that's right. You can make anything up on LinkedIn. And we all know this, right? I I posted right. a I posted a comment the other day on my LinkedIn and I, I talked about the exaggeration of credentials. And it's interesting, those of you in talent acquisition understand the pain that we go through. But remember this, LinkedIn is a marketing tool. If you're sourcing through LinkedIn, look for keywords, but don't treat it as gospel. It's not. Okay, it is what it is. It's a marketing tool. There's going to be a flaw in the content. Some of it is good, but just as good as it is, some of it can be fabricated. And I do know that many employers use LinkedIn to take uh, job applications and hire directly through LinkedIn because LinkedIn does uh, have job posting boards. So people are taking their resumes and submitting them directly. So probably the important thing for our listeners to know is that if you are taking applications or accepting resumes through LinkedIn, keep in mind that those, just like the resumes you're getting via email or fax, have not yet been validated. So like Danny said, it's very good to use a background screening company, if not using Group 1, somebody uh, to validate that information. Yeah, good point, David. And, and the other thing to this, and I stated earlier, was remember this, LinkedIn does not provide you or provide any of us an attestation basically stating that this information is true there's no attestation on linkedin i didn't know that yeah it's like with facebook there's no attestation hmm. there's nothing to tell you on facebook or on twitter or on instagram or on any of those social media sites that what you're posting is accurate and true tell our listeners what you mean by attestation i can barely say that word yeah what is what does that mean in At uh, layman terms in layman terms is in your application for employment folks at all of your organizations. If you look at the last two paragraphs before the person signs off, there's a statement that says in summary, I attest that this information that I provided is true and honest and anything that is found to be untrue and false can lead to my disqualification for employment. That's the attestation. Right. And so there wouldn't be that type of attestation right. on there's, LinkedIn or right. The, it, again, anywhere on social media. Anywhere yeah. on social media. Because again, social media is free. It, it, again, it, it's, it's got its purpose. But it, one of the purposes is not to qualify and screen candidates for your jobs. So you as talent acquisition folks, you need to actually screen them yourself and then bring them in and get them go through another rigor of your process. You just can't take their word for it. And, and the thing with the candidate content and the awards and honors are also this. Remember this, awards and honors are subjective. They're subjective. They're not objective. They're not in any way part of the person's performance appraisal. It is a subjective. It's sometimes given to somebody because they like them. It's because somebody was close to them. Somebody worked well on a project. Popularity contest. Popularity contest. But it is not based on merit. So remember that. When you see that on social media, don't let that fool you. Okay. So a couple of things and we're going to wrap up and let's go to references, let's go to the next one. We talked about this at the beginning, work related, go back five years, don't go back more than, don't use Danny's 1974 letter. Those guys are no Might longer be, with us. Well, that's 40 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are no longer with us. That's a decade. Yeah, ago. yeah. I was, I was only 15 at the time, folks. Um, <laughs> Ask specific questions in the, in the resume and specifically work related. You know, how did they respond to a task? You know, what was their most uh, glaring, you know, issue? What was the most outstanding, you know, performance trait? Things like that. The reference letters, I tell you what, I would not trust them. That's just, again, being skeptical of me. Just be careful. Anytime somebody writes a letter before and has it already written, there may be something you want to always reconsider. All right. So real life case scenarios, a uh, couple of things that we've already talked through. You know, we talked about name falsification. We talked about education. We talked about, uh, I think, uh, licensures. And finally, we talked about job employment descriptions where people have to sometimes falsify the narratives. Just remember this. You're, you're, you all have the same examples at your place. If it happened once, it's going to happen again. Just remember, to me, all these things happen in cycles. Be prepared to address them, okay? 
So let's go to our summary because I know we're wrapping up on time and some of you may have questions. So um, in summary, always use your primary source to verify your information. In other words, don't trust secondhand, don't trust the documents that the candidates provide you. While they're well-meaning, they are sometimes have been exaggerated. Be wary of documents provided by the candidates only because sometimes they have been manufactured. It takes about five to six days to validate information properly, depending on where we're trying to get it from. HR's responsibility is to ensure a candidate's qualifications are verified accurately. That is, your, you're the gatekeeper, folks. And because you're the gatekeeper, whenever that person has an issue on the job, it's going to come back to you and to us, too. We, we're right there with you. I'm right there with you. And then eventually you're responsible for hiring individuals with integrity and are accountable for the content in their resume. Even though you didn't write it, guess what you did? You accepted it and you went with it. So we all have to be in partners with this. All right? So what questions do we have out there, Chris? Well, first I want everyone, to, I want to thank uh, Danny and uh, David for just a terrific presentation. Here's uh, their contact information. And uh, let's go ahead, and we do have some questions that have come in. Let's see here. Charmaine, how you doing? I'm glad you sent a question in. This is from Charmaine. If a candidate states they are self-employed or a freelancer, is that something that can be verified? That's a good question. And, and one of the things that we're having to do now is modify our process, Charmaine. What we can do is that the, if we get an actual client that they served, or, or a company that they provided the service to. We get that contact information, we'll validate it with them. We would need the name of the company, the contact person, and a good email address to verify it with. Okay. All right, here's another question. Can I disqualify a candidate if they lie on their resume? And this is something that's happened recently with a certain political candidate. Yeah, well, unfortunately, there's no, <laughs> <laughs> There's no group one at that level, Chris. Because <laughs> uh, myself, I would have disqualified well, him. I mean, a job candidate. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, but to, to what David and I were talking about a little while ago is the attestation part. Right. If they sign the attestation, guess what? They get disqualified, and you can disqualify them if they lied in that no process. Yep. Yeah, That's knowingly. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. It looks like we're running up. Unfortunately, if anybody else has questions, we're probably not going to be able to get to a lot of the other questions. But if you do have questions, our contact information, in fact, Chris, you might want to back that slide up and just make sure that uh, everyone has our phone numbers and our email address. Feel free to send an email to Danny or myself and would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much for attending uh, today's uh, webinar with Group One. Um, and I wanted to say, ahead, David, that we recorded it and we're going to post it oh, online and thank I'll you send very much to everyone who is registered. Perfect. Thanks so much. And until next time, we'll see you all later.